Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to Social Sciences One. Uh, we, we have uh, four of us on the panel today. Okay, we have uh, social science is the, is, the, is the biggest cluster in, in AFSS. We have seven departments and uh, the first panel will have four of the departments represented. Uh, I'm from sociology and then we will have uh, Georgios from economics, Dr. Georgios, and then uh, Dr. Kamalini from geography and Dr. Elaine Tan from political science. All right. Um, just let me say a, a bit of a, 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 a bit of things about uh, social sciences. Um, now we, we split the the, the, pa the the social sciences into two panels mainly because it's big. Uh, we have seven, and we didn't want to cram all seven uh, of us into a panel because then we will all be talking more uh, about ourselves uh, rather than addressing the questions. So the logic of the split from between social sciences one and social sciences two is a bit arbitrary, uh, but there is a there is kind of a logic to it, and, and the logic is is that uh, social sciences one uh, being uh, sociology, economics, uh, geography, and political science, um, as compared to uh, social work, communications and new media, right, and uh, psychology, social sciences too are more applied social sciences, all right, to put it that way, uh, with a lot more practical kind of applications in the field. Uh, this is not to say that social sciences one, uh, you know, don't have any practical applications, we do, right, but, but it's because these disciplines are in some ways older, um, and more established, so there's a lot more theoretical history, theoretical traditions uh, that, that 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 is linked to uh, the, the four the four departments here, the four dis disciplines. All right. Um, I mean, it will it will come to obvious, all right, when when we start talking, right? I mean, geography, of course, you know, geographers start out with mapping the world first, so they 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 are in some ways uh, the most practical uh, of of us are of us all. And economics, of course, is is, is incredibly practical, right? I mean, we we are in budget season now, right? If you're following Parliament, right? It's all about economics. Right. But it's also about society. And this is where the, the, the sociology comes in, right? Uh, de dealing with social issues and whatnot. And of course, it is all about political science too. Right? It's about the politics between um, different kinds of ideas right? and, and different interests uh, being negotiated in parliament. Right? Okay, so let, let us begin by uh, offering um, a brief summary, or about six to seven minutes maybe, um, of our own disciplines, uh, kind of like what we do. Right and 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 what are the kinds of uh, uh, critical thinking that we we promote we promote the kind of research that we research skills that we promote uh, and and help you to learn. All right, uh, let's go by alphabetical order in terms of the disciplinary names. So, Dr. Georgios, economics. About economics, uh, what economics is about? Uh, I would like to start first with the meaning of the the word, perhaps. So. Economics uh, has two parts, the, the word has two parts. The first part is perhaps familiar. Uh, eco, you may have heard words, other words that start with uh, this prefix, eco, like ecosystem or uh, ecology. All these things, the eco part means house. And then the, the second part means uh, distribute. So, Economics is about distributing in a house. So the question is distribute what? Uh, distribute resources, distribute resources. So economics is the discipline, the discipline that uh, studies the allocation and distribution of resources. Now, unfortunately, uh, resources uh, are not unlimited in uh, this world. Uh, therefore, we have a problem. We need to study the distribution. If resources were unlimited, there would be no need for economics. There would be no need for us to be here right now. So uh, the fact that uh, resources are limited uh, require a way of distributing the resources. Now, in nature in general, this as we know, distribution of resources is uh, handled by the law of the jungle. So basically it's mediated by the use of force. Uh, our relatives in uh, nature, they, uh, the key characteristic that they have is to use force in order to distri distribute resources. Now humans are part of nature, uh, but um, in humans, the use of force, even though occasionally it is still use, used, um, its use is decreasing over time. 
And as uh, Steven Pinker has taught us, uh, uh, right now we're at a state of the world uh, where uh, it's the best in this respect. The use of force is very, very limited. And it has gone down historically. So humans do not really use force, generally use force in order to distribute resources. What do they use? They use the uh, thing that is the most characteristic for them, which is their uh, intelligence. This is what basically differentiates them from other species in nature. And since intelligence is the characteristic of humans, um, the, the humans had to find an, an institution that would match their key, this key characteristic of theirs. And this institution is what we call the market. The market is uh, the human equivalent of the law of the jungle. It's just that uh, instead of using force, it's using basically uh, intelligence. Um, so what is being exchanged in the market? Many things are, pretty much everything is exchanged in markets, um, but economists, more, most particularly, they focus on uh, goods and services uh, like uh, products, like uh, labor, like stocks, bonds, and things like that. Economists study um, how these things are being exchanged uh, in a market. So if you decide to pursue this discipline, um, basically you will learn how markets operate and you will acquire skills that perhaps will make you marketable in those markets so that you acquire uh, resources uh, as well. And perhaps this is not the only uh, purpose of education, but perhaps is one important purpose of education uh, to allow you to uh, acquire uh, resources. Hi, so my name is Kamalini Ramdas, um, but most people call me Dr. K here on campus if you're a student and my colleagues call me Kamal, okay? So either, either way of calling me is good. Um, uh, so I'm a social and cultural geographer, all right? And so the million dollar question is what is geography and what is the difference between geography and sociology? That's the question that's appeared in the chat box as well. So I'm, you know, I think maybe Daniel and I can duke it out later, but uh, I may hopefully in my answering of the question, you'll get a sense of what geography is and what it isn't. Okay, so I'm um, picking up on the theme of the law of the jungle. Geography is precisely that. We go out into the jungle. That's one part of what we do, right? We're about the natural environment, right? We we like to see ourselves as a discipline that sits at the nexus of human environment relationships. So for many of you coming into the CHS program, it is a discipline that will allow you to use some of your scientific training in the study of physical geography, but also in terms of those of you who are perhaps more interested in the arts and social sciences type topics traditionally would also find geography something uh, that you're familiar with, right? So the human environment relationship is what we're very interested in. The second thing we wanna talk about here is nature versus culture. So in some sense, when we think about human beings, you know, as being part of the world, part of the earth, right? Um, we are also limited by the natural uh, earth system around us, as well as able to adapt, right, adapt to this environment, right? And these adaptations can have a positive as well as a negative impact on planet earth. So as geographers, we're interested at looking at this uh, sort of relationship between nature and culture, right? So in that sense, it'd be interesting to see what Daniel has to say about this as a sociologist, right? The relationship between nature and culture. And finally, for most geographers, we are obsessed with this term called space. And by space, right, we are talking about um, Cartesian space in some sense, right? But we also understand that there's an emotional aspect to space, which is why we differentiate between space and place. So we think of space as something that's out there, but also something that exists in our minds and in our hearts. And this is where there's an overlap between sociology and geography. So what's this obsession about drawing lines between disciplines? I think we're trying to move away from that if I get my understanding of the College of Humanities and Sciences. So that question about what's the difference between sociology and geography, I think should be used to, to sort of, um, for us to think through what our disciplinary histories are, 
right? So that means what is it that we want to hold true to? But it shouldn't straightjacket us or hamper us from imagining other possibilities. So the whole point of interdisciplinarity is to really think about how we can have these kinds of conversations, right? So coming through to the College of Humanities and Sciences, I think that is what we're trying to do here, have those kinds of conversations, right? Bearing in mind what our histories are, but then wanting to take it down other paths, right? So geography, three points, human environment relationships, space and place, and human and culture. Uh, nature and culture. So what are some major topics you might cover in geography? You do things like climate change or climate action, sustainability. Um, also within the human geography type area, we would be looking at things like mobilities, migration, um, urban planning, livability, tourism, heritage, geopolitics. And funnily enough, if you look at all the modules offered, there'll be some version of this in sociology, political science, and economics. So what's the big deal? Geographers are obsessed about space. Okay, so when I teach my students, I ask them, where is the space in all this? You sound like a sociologist, right? And I don't mean that as an insult, right? But actually they have to demonstrate what does this have to do with space, right? So I think the key word here I wanna focus on is space. Now in terms of research and technical skills, what will you get out of geography? Well, if you're a hard scientist kind of person, you'll actually be in a lab. So our department has got a physical geography lab, uh, like an earth lab, where many of my students are doing experiments, right? So when I go in there, I'm totally out of my game here because that's not the kind of geographer I am, right? So they actually have like Petri dish, chemistry experiments going on, all kinds of strange things for me, strange. Okay, for some of you, that might be your bread and butter. So geography allows you to do that kind of work, right? So if you're really into that kind of experimentation as in physical experimentations with chemicals and samples, you will get to do that. But also we do things like geographic information systems, which is where we look at spatial, spatial analytics and how we might project some of that data using technology. And I think from the human, the, uh, from the, the human geography part, we'll probably do a lot more of the type of um, uh, technical skills that you'd be familiar with, like interviews, focus group discussions. And I think that will be similar to what sociology, sociologists and economics and political science uh, methodologies also, right? These are similar, right? So actually, when you come through the CHS program, uh, right at the start, some of these methods will be something that you're taught. So that by the time you come into the disciplinary major focus, you would actually have some of this background already, right? And what you'll then be going into is the specifics for each discipline, what are some technical skills you might need, right? And last but not least, I was asked to talk about social issues, right? So of course, for geographers, the key social issue that we're interested in is, of course, one of the things is climate action and its impact on human beings, also issues around sustainability and food safety and food security. But from the human geography perspective, I think issues around um, migration, uh, refugees, right? Some of the issues around natural resources and geopolitics, that's also of interest to us. So for me to end this whole thing, what's the difference? It shouldn't matter, but if you ask a geographer holding a gun to their head, they'll say it's all about space. I'm going to stop, stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kamal. Uh, Elaine? Yeah. Hi. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. So I'm uh, Elaine from the political science department. Uh, and I'll actually be talking about two different majors. So I'll be talking about our political science major as well as um, our global studies program that's housed in um, the under the political science department. Um, so I hope my fellow panelists can forgive me if I take just a little bit more time, but of course tell me off if I take too much time. Um, and so I see in the Q&A there are some questions about the difference between uh, PS and GL, political science and global studies, so I'll go into that. Um, but let's start off with political science, right? So political science is the study of politics, obviously. And um, as Daniel kind of suggested earlier, politics is everywhere. So um, we are really studying human interactions. We are studying forms of conflict and cooperation between humans and how these forms of conflict and cooperation lead to certain outcomes. And of, of course, if I'm going to characterize politics like that, it's going to be really broad. So when people talk about politics, they usually, usually think about two things. They think about power politics, right? So the use of power, and they think about government. Uh, so of course, a big part of the kind of political anal uh, analysis you're going to do if you're taking a political science course is you're going to study how politics affects conflict, cooperation, and outcomes. Uh, but we're also going to study things like how do our moral values, our identities, our beliefs about the world affect how we interact with other humans. 
And of course, if you're coming to the political science department, um, you're going to spend a lot of time studying governments uh, because how we choose who governs us and how our governments actually go about the business of governing us. Those are really important topics that affect all of us. Uh, but we also study non-governmental actors. Um, we study civil society and grassroots organizations, um, terrorist groups, social movements, for-profit companies, and so on. Uh, and that's because the ways in which these various actors and entities interact with each other and with governments uh, affect the world in significant ways. So some typical questions you are likely to encounter in political science classes are, if we are demanding freedom and equality in our societies, what exactly do we mean by freedom and equality, right? What are our beliefs and values when it comes to politics? Um, more empirical, Kind of questions like why do countries go to war with each other and conversely what makes it possible for countries to settle their differences peacefully um, and cooperate with each other so why are some countries more democratic or more developed than others how do we deal with a problem like corruption how does the government decide on public policies and so on so in political science we basically have four subfields some of you were asking about kind of uh, specializing in particular themes or topics in political science so we have four subfields and the majority of our classes fall under, would fall under one of each of these uh, four subfields. So I'll just quickly describe them, all right? So um, the first subfield is comparative politics, where we are studying the political system of different systems of different countries. And from studying politics in different countries and different regions around the world, we gain a better understanding of issues like development and democracy and so on. Um, we have the subfield of international relations, so the politics between countries, so we study how states as well as other international actors like your large multinational corporations, your global civil society, how they interact. We have the subfield of governance and public policy, so um, how do organizations and bureaucracies behave and make policies, um, you do a lot of uh, policy analysis in those kind of classes as well. And the fourth subfield is political theory. And in our PT courses, you're going to learn to think philosophically and deeply about fundamental ideas like ethics and justice and equality and so on um, that are essential to our political beliefs and values. All right, so um, that's kind of the substance of uh, a lot of what we do in political science. Um, and so what do you get out of all of that? What kind of skills did you, do you get? Um, I think one of the things that we don't talk about enough uh, is that our students gain exposure and insights into politics in different parts of the world. So we have modules on Southeast Asian politics, African, Middle Eastern politics, and so on. We have modules that focus on local and national politics, and then we've got modules that focus on international politics. And so having this kind of knowledge is really useful uh, for all of you, many of whom are going to be kind of quite mobile, moving to different countries. Uh, once you graduate and even as students. Um, but more fundamentally, I think you are immersed in debates about complex issues of grave importance. Um, you develop insights into political systems and institutions that really affect all aspects of our life and all aspects of society. Um, and when we study politics, we are studying human relations and we are studying how the world works. Right, so our students are trained to think analytically and critically about human motivations and behavior to understand institutional and organizational dynamics and how people's beliefs and identities and so on shape their behavior. Okay, so that's political science. I still have to talk about glo global studies. All right, so I'll try to keep it quick. Um, so the global studies program is a different major, it's, it's different from political science, but it's housed under the political science department. And it's a program that focuses on globalization. So we are thinking about how different parts of the world are connected in all of these different ways through uh, migration, communication technologies, pandemics, um, transnational businesses, through forms of international cooperation and so on. And so we're studying all of these issues through a global perspective. Now, as you can imagine, these sorts of global issues um, involve all domains of life, right? So if you are going to study um, the COVID pandemic and our response to the COVID pandemic, uh, you can't just study it from a political science point of view. You have to kind of understand economics, culture, and so on. And so this is why our Global Studies program is a multidisciplinary program. 
So what happens if you do a major in global studies is our students will take some core modules where they learn more about these global perspectives and issues. And then they are able to take modules across the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So you are able to take modules in political science, ge geography, history, and so on, that are recognized as contributing towards your global studies major requirements. Um, and that is so that students can draw upon the knowledge and concepts from the different social sciences and humanities to understand the different aspects of globalization. Okay, so um, in global studies, we have, uh, we group the courses under kind of four main themes. Um, so the first is colonialism, security, and global order. Second, global health, environment, and technology. Third, global political economy. And fourth, people's cultures and globalization. So if you're taking courses under the global political economy theme, you might take modules from the Department of Economics on Southeast Asian economies, or you might take uh, modules in the PS Political Science Department on economic development and so on. So this is a, a pretty exciting non-traditional program that gives students a kind of unique global perspectives um, and a multidisciplinary perspective on these important issues. Right. And so this is one of the main takeaways that students get, that you get this, you get this global perspective, right? Because you're studying globalization. Students need to think globally and holistically about the various different actors and forces and dynamics involved in each of these issues. And they use knowledge from the different disciplines in um, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So again, we can't just think about the role of Singapore's government or Singaporean consumers and companies when we're studying climate change. We need a global perspective on this issue. Um, and so that global and multidisciplinary perspectives is something that's quite attractive uh, about the Global Studies program. Um, the program also puts a lot of emphasis on the practical application uh, of academic uh, knowledge. So because so many of these aspects of globalization that we study have enormous policy significance, so part of our program also involves applying all of these academic knowledge to policy issues. So um, if you're majoring in global studies in your fourth year, there's a kind of capstone project, uh, what we call the task force module, where students in small teams um, form sort of a policy or advisory committee, and they choose a policy issue. Um, and so they apply all of the academic knowledge they've learned to this kind of policy issue, and then they produce a final report with policy recommendations and they kind of give a presentation. So you can imagine how this kind of um, experience, right, with researching policy issues and then coming up with realistic policy recommendations would be incredibly valuable to um, all of you. All right, I'm going to stop there and pass this over to Daniel. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, so let me talk a bit about sociology. Now, uh, I think Kamal has done a very uh, uh, interesting thing, which is to um, use one word to basically, uh, you know, make you remember what geography is about, right, which is space. So if, 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 if I would do that for sociology, I would say that it is just simply society. All right, uh, anything that has to do with social. So in some sense, we can almost lay claim sociology to the whole of social sciences because of the social word in there, right? Because it's, 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 it's about the relationship between people, right? And the different kind of uh, things that go into there and the different factors that go into there. Uh, one of the key things that we, that we look at, uh, the attributes of that social relation that we look at is how people relate to each other in terms of race, gender, class, sexuality, nationality, and all these things that divide us as human beings. So that, that is the key thing, right? How we divide each other into, into different categories and how then do we relate to each other uh, using these categories. It's unavoidable, it's inevitable, right? Uh, so in some ways, uh, learning about sociology help us to understand why there is racism and therefore also the tools to, for example, tackle racism. Uh, same with uh, uh, things like gender inequality, uh, social inequality, class inequality, and, 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 and whatnot, right? So these are kind of major topics in sociology. Now, I teach urban sociology, um, which is very close to geography. So I work a lot with uh, a lot of geographers uh, in my research and in my teaching. Uh, and urban sociology, and, and this is a kind of a build on what Kamal said, uh, you know, about the difference between geography and sociology. Uh, 
I have a lot of geography students who come and take my module, urban sociology. Uh, and and I, I, I always joke with them, and it's, it's, it's half true, and in fact, it's mostly true, that geography students, when they go to a street, for example, and, and maybe the, the research question will be, oh, why is this street so lively, right? What makes it successful in terms of getting people to go there and, and, and you know, do consumption or to do business or do creative industry and so forth, like Tanjong Paga, right, or Duxton. Why is it so, so successful? Geography students who go there, they map the space first. Then they talk to people and discover the social relationships between different groups of people there. Sociology students, they go there, they talk to people first, right? They go there, you know, talk to people, you know, discover all oh, the kind of social relations. And so, and so then they start to map the space. But eventually you see the convergence, right? Both disciplines converge uh, in terms of doing the mapping and also talking to people, right? From very different starting points. And in some ways, when we get geography students and sociology students talking uh, about the urban, you get very interesting kind of perspectives developing because from different starting points, the convergence actually then brings a, brings a, a lot of creativity, a lot of innovative ideas and insights right, into, the, into, into, the, into answering the, the question, right? Okay, so what are the kind of research and critical thinking skills we, we, we teach students? Um, Research-wise, uh, very similar to, to, to the other disciplines, we, we have both uh, classroom lab-based kind of uh, uh, activities, all right, uh, which is usually linked to library work um, and also statistics. All right, we, we do a lot of statistics too. Uh, in one arm of uh, uh, sociology, we, we call it dem demography or demographic uh, sociology. We do a lot of calculations about you know, uh, patterns in the population. Uh, healthcare, for example, is very much tied to quantitative sociology or demographic sociology. Uh, and what we do here is we, 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 we figure out, you know, okay, these are the kind of cost, healthcare costs that's going forward. Um, what are the kinds of healthcare needs do the, the population had, uh, need, uh, require? All right. How, what, what are the, the issues, right, with regards to specific uh, segments of the population uh, that, with regards to healthcare, right, healthcare needs and so on and so forth. So these are the kind of, and we, and we, we do a lot of statistics. Now, sociologists were, were, were one of the first people in Singapore warning the PAP government that if you don't stop the stop at two policy in the 1980s, we're going to get, you know, uh, a problem in the future, which is the fact that, you know, if you do the calculation, the population will start to decline because of birth rates will decline. Right, so so we were the first ones to kind of you know uh, kind of alert the government to this issue, right? Because we have that ability, right, to calculate and look at numbers in that way in terms of social statistics. All right, now the other uh, kind of field work that we do, the kind of research work that we do, is to go into the field. So sending my students, for example, to a street, uh, you know, in let's say downtown, right, Chinatown, and so forth, and doing research, talking to people, mapping out the space, um, and and equipping them with the ability to do ethnography, which is to, which, which is to uh, map communities and cultures and their, and their life worlds, all right? their values, their norms, the way they see the world, the way they have, the, the meanings that they have uh, about space and each other, all right? about, about their social relationships. All right? So some of the major issues, uh, social issues that sociology will help you understand, anything that, that has to do with society. All right? uh, so a lot of my students, I mean, they, you know, they come in to, 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 to NUS, um, not really understanding what, the, what is happening, let's say in parliament, right? The kind of budget debates about, about uh, social issues and, and, and all kinds of issues, right? Uh, with regards to all the different ministries, they, they don't quite understand what is really happening. They think basically this is just basically politics, right? Simple politics, not, not the kind of poly, uh, complex politics that, that Elaine was talking about, but simple politics between PAP and, and the opposition. But it's not just that, right? But then they start to see uh, after taking sociology that the different issues Right, that 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 matter, right? Uh, that, that and the different perspectives that can be taken to 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 see a particular issue, and then to evaluate the the pros and cons of adopting different policies with regards to to, to different kind of issues, right? So these are the kind of uh, thinking skills, right? And and, and topics uh, and major social issues that 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 sociology will help you to understand, which is almost practically everything, all right? Okay, so let us move to the question and answer uh, segment. Uh, Maybe maybe let's go one round um, and 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 you know uh, to have each of us uh, text us some of the questions that we that we want to answer and then also highlight uh, and also get others to jump in when we when we need to if we if we if we need to answer something that's broader right that's that's applicable to all the the, the social sciences um, so maybe Georgia you want to go first There's, is there any specific questions that you want to ask i think one of the questions that might be relevant for you and come out is the is a question of the jc jc economics jc geography right and the jump to nus uh, kind of geography and economics yes um so uh maybe just to uh say a few things related to uh what i was saying before 
uh, because uh, when I stopped, it seemed like uh, economics is uh, only about markets. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, in recent years, uh, maybe in the last uh, 60, 70 years, um, even though the discipline, the discipline of economics when it started like 250 years ago, it was only uh, pr pretty much exclusively focused on uh, markets and how markets operate. Um, in uh, recent years, uh, the field expanded in uh, different domains uh, and uh, encompassed other um, topics that perhaps would not seem related to economics. For example, uh, economists have tackled issues related to family formation or to interpersonal relations, relations or uh, discrimination. Uh, or uh, crime. All these things uh, used to be outside the domain of economics, uh, but in uh, recent years, economists expanded there. The reason is that, as perhaps you know, the, the tools that economists use are uh, mathematics and statistics, and because these tools are powerful and can yield uh, results that are sort of numeric, numerical, and as a result, um, perhaps more objective uh, rather than um, qualit uh, qualitative uh, answers. Uh, for that reason, uh, economists uh, like expanded to all these other fields. So this is um, one more aspect um, that um, in modern economics, uh, people are uh, interested in other than the market. So someone who is perhaps not interested in uh, the markets um, and the analysis of the markets, and they're more interested in these other uh, fields, uh, such as the ones I mentioned, uh, economics has uh, a lot to offer there too. Now, with respect to the to your question, Daniel, about the the uh, junior college uh, and um, the differences with university, obviously, I'm not an expert, but from what I've, I have heard, uh, in the um, in the junior colleges in Singapore, uh, the analysis is more uh, qualitative. So perhaps this is something that you should have in mind if you're interested in economics, that economics is heavily quantitative, um, uh, starting from the, from the first year perhaps, and it gets progressively more and more uh, quantitative. It's not math, uh, but it's, uh, it's using a lot of math. So if you're not comfortable with math, uh, perhaps you can, you can choose another discipline. Uh, uh, yeah, come to sociology. So. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know uh, how the other uh, disciplines here uh, deal with math, but uh, I don't know. There are other, other domains that do not use math, right? So you're not gonna be comfortable uh, if you don't like math, you can do it, but you're not going to like it. It's going to be, it's going to be miserable. Okay. So that's, I think that's an important takeaway. Okay. We, we may like the, we may like, you know, what economic studies and be interested in uh, either the markets or the other stuff I said, but if we're not, if we are not like intellectually, uh, equipped or willing to learn uh, math, uh, then we're going to have a problem. And, you know, it's not worth it probably, right? Just just do another thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Come on, come on. How about geography? Yep. Hi. So I want to pick up on this uh, point about, you know, like if you're math and not math, you know, so I think the good thing about the CHS program is that you have this thing called unrestricted electives. So if you think math isn't your cup of tea, but you still like economics, I'm sure there are opportunities to do modules in economics. So I'm here like tooting for the other discipline. Um, you know, you can still take uh, some of this stuff that you're interested in. So I think this is the beauty of the CHS program, right? It's flexible. It's actually you get to choose what you want to do. So maybe you're like me and you've 
suck at math, right? Um, but you're interested about maybe in small policy related discussions or theoretical discussions that have to do with economics. And maybe there might be something in the module offerings that is of interest to you, right? That's offered as either a elective or something that's based at say a 1000 level where you can sort of enter into a discussion without that kind of background knowledge or even maybe the technical um, language of mathematics, right? Now, coming back to geography and some of the questions around prerequisites, I mean, does it matter if I've done A-level geographies or geography or not? So the, the assumption in our department is that it's great if you have, but it doesn't mean you will be disadvantaged if you don't, right? So the assumption is that when you come into the program, if you pick geography as your major, right, um, you will be taught as though you have no prerequisites. So if you look at our gateway module, they actually prepare you for our program, right? So and how we do this is that we have a first year like 1101 module which gives you that broad brushstroke kind of introduction and then we have for all intents and purposes a level two our second year module is more or less the, or our second year program is like what we call like the basket of modules you would have to take to call yourself a card carrying geographer right so you would have to take a methods module you would have to take gis you would have to do one intro module for social and cultural geography politics economics and space uh, and the final one is tropical environmental change. So these three research groups are what our geography, our geography department are about. And broadly speaking, for those of you who do human versus physical geography, it's one physical geography research group and two human geography research groups, right? So each of these research groups are sort of sub-disciplines within geography, and there's an intro module for each one of them. So when you decide to major in geography, you would be required to have taken the first broad brushstroke course on 1101, and then you would have had to take a methods, GIS, as well as one from each of these, which are all pitched at level 2000. So if you have no geography background in your first two years in the program, you will learn how to become a geographer. Now, if you have done geography before, some of this might be familiar to you, but you do have to remember that when we approach geography as academics, we're also teaching it different from the A-level syllabus, okay? So at some level, the A-level syllabus is a particular kind of beast, all right? But here, we are not um, limited by those kinds of curriculum and national exams. So much of the topic that you see about geography is about our own research interests as academics. So this is the really cool thing about being in the university, right? It's not geography the way you remember it from the university or economics in the same way, right? I think it's a little bit different because the people who are crafting the modules are actually people who are academics. They're doing research in this. So you'll get some element of this from your A-levels, but actually we're we want to take you elsewhere with it. Right, we want to say like, okay, so you learned all that stuff. That's great, right? And even if you didn't learn it, that's fine too. Let's talk a little bit about that, but where can we go with this, right? This is the question, right? So with the interdisciplinary program, I think it's those kind of big questions that we want to have answered and we want to give you the skills to be able to have that kind of conversation, right? So to answer the question, does it matter if you have A-level geography? Absolutely not, right? And I don't think, and in fact, if you look at it, many of my colleagues who are geographers don't necessarily, they're not necessarily people who did A-level geography, nor did they do very well at A-level geography, right? So that is no measure of how successful you will be as a geographer. And there's another question there in the chat about jobs and um, what, what we can do with geography. So um, of course, the kind of geography jobs, geography related jobs most people know are teaching, right? Um, planning, and maybe like working with GIS and people say, well, how many planners do we really need? And how many GIS people do we really need? I think my answer to this is you should, for me at least, right, my experience as an undergraduate was never about, yes, of course I want to get a job, but I didn't go into it thinking I was going to be something, right? I had just this vague idea that I would get out into the world and find a job. And funnily enough, the job that I ended up doing was so far from what I was trained to do. It was hilarious. I should have been in Giorgio's department because I worked for The Economist, right? So I was a geographer and I worked for the Economist Intelligence Unit that does research on things to do with risk analysis and all kinds of other things, right? So this, what was I doing there, right? So, so my point is that if you get the right kind of training in an interdisciplinary program and you enjoy your university life and you start asking those critical questions, you will interview well. People will notice you. When you go for the job, they will say, I want that person on my team. Never mind if they're a geographer, they're asking the right questions, so I want them, right? So this is what I want to say to you. I think you should embrace your university life as an, in a way, an opportunity to learn new things and ask those kinds of questions. And you're going to be in the company of people, hopefully in your class, who want to ask those kinds of questions. And certainly your professors are interested in answering those questions. And if you embrace that, I think that 
the opportunities for you will be endless. And I don't mean teaching, urban planning, and GIS only. Of course, if you want to do all those things, that's great, right? The world needs more impassioned uh, teachers and certainly more creative planners, right? But you could also end up somewhere far from what you think, you know, where far from where you thought you might originally be right so i think you should give yourself that kind of scope for that yeah. possibility yeah, yeah. so i'll yeah. stop yeah. That, that's a good point come because i think i think students come in right we have a there's a lot of pressure to be practical um but i think the 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 chs is actually a, a, an advancement on 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 this on this principle it's it's, it's also about exploration university right come in explore the different modules there's a lot of scope for exploration right go take the different modules that you that you think you're interested in and find your own path in life uh, and chs by providing the common curriculum kind of forces you to, to you know to kind of uh, have a sample sample of you know everything right so that you can oh okay i really like this do this or maybe i'll become a scientist instead of being a social scientist or maybe i'll be a social scientist instead of a scientist i came from a science background and i love physics but i wanted to be a war journalist or a greenpeace activist all right, but I fell in love with sociology, <laughs> so so that's that's the kind of thing in, in the university. It kind of shapes, I think, uh, the uh, you know your 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 passion. You know, if, if you allow it yourself to be shaped, uh, Okay, so 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 career options, but okay, let's go back to the practical, right? Career options for sociology. Um, I I think about the, the numbers is about maybe about forty percent will go into the ministries because we have the kind of skills that allow, you know, uh, to do that, 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 that students have uh, when, they, when they graduate, right? They have the kind of skills they can bring to the ministries to do uh, policy research, uh, also to do, to do with frontline uh, work. Uh, so a lot of my, uh, 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 my, my cohort mates uh, uh, who graduated from sociology, they, a lot of them ended up in MOM, Ministry of Manpower. Uh, that, this was in the 1990s where a lot of foreign workers were coming in. Um, and they had a kind of knowledge about how to, you know, how, how to deal with the regulations and the protection of migrant worker rights and issues uh, on the ground, right? O of course, there's some limitations because you're working for MOM, Ministry of Manpower. Uh, but they went in with the idea that, you know, they want to be on the front line um, doing that kind of work, you know, um, looking up the, the dormitories, looking up uh, employers, uh, kind of track record and, and investigating issues like injuries, uh, non-payment of wages for migrant workers, and so on and so forth, right? So, so you have different kind of um, career options even within the ministries, right? Being a civil servant is actually quite a diverse uh, uh, a job scope, right? There's, the, the, there's a lot of things that you can do. Also, so about forty percent will go into ministries, and the sixty percent uh, will go into the private sector, and a lot of them are going to different fields. Uh, sociology is kind of special because we are uh, uh, because we are we, we have three tracks uh, in in some ways, right? We don't really organize the department into three tracks, but you have quantitative sociology, those who, who crunch numbers and statistics, social statistics. We have qualitative sociology, those who study, uh, do interviews, uh, focus group interviews, do ethnography, um, and study uh, social relations uh, uh, shapes in terms of meanings and so on and so forth. Uh, we also have anthropologists, and these are people who are very attuned to culture, right? So to answer. Kamal's earlier question on what is the relationship between nature and culture, how the sociology see it. The anthropologists are the ones who kind of try to see that that, that thing. Uh, and, and quite interestingly, anthropology has becoming has been gaining ground in a lot of businesses because anthropologists can go in and study human nature and culture at the same time and understand how people kind of relate to processes and also user interface. So Apple, Google, a lot of tech companies hire anthropologists to study how people use products in their everyday life uh, and what are, the, what are the kind of functions that they that will be very useful for them, that will, they will you know, make, it, make, make uh, their, their lives meaningful and useful. So anthropologists study you know, in a very close up way the, that, that kind of interaction. Um, Elaine, would you like to say something about uh, maybe the job prospects um, for, for political science and also global studies? Yeah, sure. Um, so because everyone's sharing their experience on the job market, I thought <laughs> I would too bad. Uh, mine is a much more conventional um, career path because um, I, I was a graduate from uh, this very department that I've returned to, um, the political science department in NUS. Uh, so I kind of like many of our political science graduates went into the ministry. So I worked for the Ministry of Law for a while um, before um, going on to do graduate studies. So, um, so in terms of job prospects for both political science as well as our global studies uh, students, quite a number of them enter the public sector. Uh, but our graduates are also pretty sought after uh, in the private sector. So if you think about, for example, um, multinational companies or nonprofit organizations, they are dealing with, let's say, um, issues of um, climate change, um, issues of migration and so on. Um, these are things that our global studies students 
um, spend a lot of time studying and they have that kind of global perspective on things, right? Um, and so that makes them very valuable to these uh, various organizations. And um, our political science and global studies students are also very cognizant of things like, you know, cultural and political sensitivities in the different parts of the world. Um, which can make you attractive candidates for things like your marketing or public communications positions. Um, they graduate with knowledge of political systems and dynamics. And so you're valuable in the business world because businesses are affected by, by politics um, essentially all the time. But of course, if you want as well, you can go on to do your grad studies and then uh, come back to teach and research at NUS. Um, I did see a question, a couple of questions about assessments, the type of assessments that students will be uh, required to submit in um, our different disciplines. So I thought I would just say a bit about political science and global studies. So um, generally, you will be doing a lot of reading and writing, probably can't escape any of that. Um, so you do have things like course readings, articles and books and so on to read. Um, you will be writing um, research essays quite often. So you'll be given uh, an essay question, you go off, do more research, and then kind of construct um, a persuasive argument that's based on evidence, based on all that research that you've done, um, and you submit that. But then sometimes your instructors are, want to be a bit funny. So it depends on your course instructor. So um, you might have things like um, students in groups organize a classroom activity to teach your classmates certain things. Right. So I've gotten my students to do that before. Submit a policy report on an issue. Submit a country case study. Um, and, and so on. So uh, a lot of it depends on your instructors. But at least for the political science department, I would say um, you will learn to write and you will learn to read and digest a lot of complex ideas. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, Georgios, you want to talk about job prospects? Uh, yes. Um, so, as you might suspect, a person with an economics degree uh, probably is uh, marketable in uh, um, banking, in uh, finance, in, um, in this kind of jobs of the uh, finance sector, of course, also in, the, in private businesses, um, either at the decision making uh, process or uh, uh, accounting, um, things like that. Um, also, I, I, I suspect also in the, um, in the public sector, uh, there is a need uh, for um, economists. Uh, now, the, the, the key thing uh, in order to become more uh, marketable, especially in the modern world, is to take advantage of the, the four years at uh, NUS to acquire uh, skills. And um, the economics program allows you to acquire such skills, especially in uh, statistics and in uh, uh, basically uh, learning how to use data. It's very important in our world to be literate uh, in this respect, uh, you should be able to uh, to know how to use and operate it, operate um, software systems that analyze uh, data. This is uh, it, this cannot be emphasized uh, enough, and this opens uh, many avenues um, in either in the private or the public sector. Uh, and uh, the, the program allows you to do this, to focus on uh, courses that uh, give you these uh, uh, skills. I repeat, this, this cannot be emphasized enough. Um, if you need to remember one thing from what I said, it should be uh, this, other than the law of the jungle. <laughs> There, there, there are quite a number of questions on whether you know people are kind of undecided between two 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 subjects like psychology and sociology you know and uh, uh, and and how do we then uh, choose and so forth. Well, take modules in both, take the exposure modules and then make a decision. Uh, 
right? Uh, my decision was made on the basis, I, I went in and I studied uh, political science, linguistics and sociology. Uh, sociology turned me on. So that's the reason why I, I decided to go with it. Uh, so that was the, the my, my decision making process. So it's, it's really up to you. Uh, and again, your know, university is about exploration and there's a, there's a lot of scope, a lot of flexibility for exploration. So explore, right? And then find out what you're really passionate in and then go with it. Um, there's, there's, there are also some questions about, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, do, do, do the disciplines complement each other? You know, should, can I take double majors? It, it, it really depends, right? So the, the, the thing is that you, you come into CHS, one third of your modules will be in the common curriculum. One third will be for your major. Right. Then you have one third uh, elective uh, modules, right? free electives. That means you can do anything you want. right? So you can do a second major there. Uh, you can also do a minor or you can just do any, or you can use it for your, for your major. That means you want to load up on your first major. So that is where the, the, the flexibility is. Right? So, so, so you, have to, you have to plan yourself, right? what, what you want for yourself. Okay, so that, that, that's really important. Uh, in terms of complementary, uh, I think all of us here will, will tell you that, of course, right, it, we, we complement each other a lot, right? And that's why social sciences, uh, uh, we, we are a cluster that, that, that you know, that, 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 that talk to each other a lot, right? In, in the sense that, uh, and, we, and we are very actually interdisciplinary. So if you look at a lot of our research projects, we work uh, across disciplines. All right. Uh, so you'll find social economics, or you know, George was talking about the how the economists were uh, moving into the to the area of the family, which is usually the domain for sociology, right? And so there's a lot of uh, also a lot of interaction there between the disciplines in terms of our own research interests, right? And and Kamal did talk about you know uh, mentioned just now that a lot of uh, the kind of learning that you have in the classroom in 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 NUS is not abstract. It's not just based on textbooks. It is actually led by our research interests. So we are professors who are, you know, into research. I mean, we are we are actively doing research, uh, and we are in some ways a lot of us are in, in the, at the frontiers of social science. Uh, we are one of the top universities in the world in terms of research. Uh, so we are at the frontiers of social science, and we are teaching you uh, what we have learned through our research. So th so that's the, the the unique thing, and I think the the best thing about NUS, right, is, is that is that is that that we are professors who are not just simply you know teachers that use a textbook to teach you. We are bringing our research into the classroom to 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 tell you what we found out and the kind of new innovations and new techniques that we have discovered, right, while doing the research. Um, okay, so what other questions do we have? Um, Daniel, there's someone asking about um, yeah. physical geography, so I want to answer the okay, question. Okay, yes, yes, I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, um, yeah. Someone's asking about, you know, can I major in geography if I really absolutely hate physical geography? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Technically, you can avoid it, although my physical geography student, uh, colleagues will be saying, what? You can't tell people that. That's not geography, right? Um, but uh, practically speaking, you can because you would be basically required to take only the level 2000 tropical environmental and uh, I mean the earth systems uh, module right which is the so called base entry module then after that if you look at what you have to take from level 3000 onwards it's up to you right that means you can choose which modules you want to take right so essentially it is possible to avoid it but we wouldn't recommend it because we see geography as a module that straddles both these kinds of understanding of space right social space as well as the physical space right so we would prefer if you didn't but if you absolutely didn't enjoy it at all that there, there are ways that you can definitely avoid it right so there's only one module that you would have to take um uh, which is at level 2000, which is a fully physical geography module, right? Um, there was also a question around internships available for geography. And I'd like to invite people to visit the geography department website. So the website, in, on the website, we have a tab that looks at our internship programs. Um, uh, we do have partnerships with different, um, obviously, stat boards like the URA, but we also work with um, um, other kinds of companies, nothing to do with the usual, um, the traditional sort. And I, I just had a quick look. We even had like a publishing company, um, you know, and a whole range of different things, right? So um, please do visit our department website and you'll see the information on our minor programs as well as our internships, right? So we're a very active department with a strong alumni tradition. So we get a lot of interesting internship opportunities through our alumni, right? So please um, visit our department website. Thank you. Okay, we, we got to wrap up. So maybe uh, some famous last words, maybe from uh, Elaine and uh, Georgios. Elaine? Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so I got a question about advice for incoming students, specific to political science, but I think this applies to all students, uh, which is that university is a great chance for you to explore. 
right? Uh, you'll be encountering new ideas, you'll be studying topics you might not have anticipated that you would study. So I teach African politics. So most students coming into political science don't really expect to study African politics, but they end up in my classes. So take the chance to uh, explore and find out what you like. Um, don't be afraid of encountering unfamiliar topics or unfamiliar countries or cultures and so on, because that's the whole point of your university education. So uh, have an open mind and stay curious and inquisitive. Georges? Uh, I also saw a question uh, about uh, how rigorous uh, the math is in economics. It's uh, quite rigorous without, you, you will not be studying math, you will be using math. So just bear this in mind. Uh, but it's it's rigorous. Like if you don't like it, you 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 you're not. It's gonna not gonna be fun. Um, now, uh, overall, uh, I um, I subscribe to what Elaine just said. Uh, just uh, you know, um, do what makes more sense uh, for you. You know, if you like one discipline, just go ahead and uh, <clears throat> and explore it. You know, it's important in uh, our uh, uh, brief lives to be happy with uh, the thing we spend more, most of our day doing. Uh, and uh, just a, a word of uh, advice, if you're uh, interested in hearing more about this, there is a, a very nice uh, um, lecture, if you will. It's a commencement address by Steve Jobs in 2005 in Stanford, who addressed exactly this thing, how important it is to be happy with uh, what you're doing in your professional lives. It's like 15 minutes or something, 20 minutes. I highly recommend it. Great. Thank you. So we're going to end it here. Uh, but okay, can I ask Georgios, come on and Elaine, can you stay behind and answer some of the questions uh, that's in the Q&A that hasn't been answered? Yeah, but uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, and if there are any questions, please contact us. Thank you.